Sam, don't actually include this. Just cut this out. I know you might be tempted to, but don't. Oh, shit. I'm sorry. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. I am your host, Simon. Welcome, welcome. This is Terrible Jobs from History, a part of our The Past Was the Worst series, because we all know it's true. I mean, is it now? <laughs> oh, the world is all sorts of f***ed up, but it was more f***ed up in the past. Never forget. Danny wrote it. I've never read it before. We're going to read it together. It's going to be a fun exploration. Then afterwards, Sam is going to do some video editing. Okay. Or memeology, as we like to refer to it here. During a particularly challenging period, a good friend once advised me to apply for a job in a call center. That sounds like a great way out of a challenging period. What would you like to do? Have people yell at you about the phone calls and how you're not supposed to be. I used to work in a call center. <laughs> And it wasn't actually that bad. It was like a business to business one. So I wasn't like selling people like double glazing or something like that. I actually didn't mind it at all. I really didn't mind it at all because I was a student and the other option was like working in a pub or a shop or something like that and earning about half as much money. Don't do it. And uh, not get to sit in an office with some mates. So it... It was all right. It sounded appealing because he told me that you can usually start work the very next day and then employ absolutely any old ruffian with the power of speech. Because I have a right to be, and I have a voice! Yes, you do. As long as you don't start beating up all the other operators on your first day, you should be absolutely fine. And even if you do, you'll probably just get a stern warning. I ended up briefly working in a call center for the O2 network. And I was told that my job was essentially to help solve customer problems. O2 is like a big mobile operator in Europe. I think, no, I'm not on O2. I'm on T-Mobile these days. I switched because on T-Mobile, I got so much more data. And then one of the guys from O2 phones up and is like, do you want to come back to O2? We could offer you a great deal. And I told them what the actual deal I'm getting is. And they're like, we can't do that. And I'm like, so maybe stop calling. <laughs> After my first day, I was told by my supervisor that I was doing okay, but I just needed to cut down on my opening salutation by about 15 minutes. <laughs> Danny, this sounds like a problem that's plagued your life. Uh, new viewers, I've been asking Danny to cut down the introductions for about a year. <laughs> and still, I open up a script and it's like 15 minutes of introduction. I'm like, Danny, what are you up to, mate? <laughs> I, get, I need to learn a lesson from your call center boss. What did he do to get you to cut it down? Because I just keep asking politely. Maybe I need to break out the whip. However, I quickly realized that helping customers solve their problems roughly translates to fielding hundreds of complaints every day from disgruntled customers who are out for blood. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, listen, so some companies like f***ed you over in someone. You're like, listen. It's like, I just work here. I'm just, I'm just the guy was employed yesterday. I didn't even like O2. <laughs> Just to make things even worse, after you'd hopefully calm down the angry customer a little bit, you then had to try and sell them a cheeky upgrade, which would never do make them go berserk again. It's like, yes, it appears that we've uh, solved the problem with uh, your voicemail not working. Can I interest you in a little extra data? Can you f*** off? <laughs> it's like, are you f***ing joking? Oh shit, I'm sorry. After one particularly soul-crushing morning, I can vividly remember feeling that I'd managed to find the worst job in the world. This was even worse than the sandwich factory job I had, where I was adding a bit of tomato to a relentless line of bread cakes that came rolling by on a conveyor belt of misery for a whole eight hours. At least, the tomatoes weren't angry with me. <laughs> so many people were like... <laughs> In a previous video, I was like, wow, I just realized that sandwiches that you buy in like petrol stations and stuff must be made somewhere. And people were like, oh boy, you're out of touch. People are making those. I just assumed it was machines. Still, I was warm and dry and safe. And unlike that job in Rotherham Park, I wasn't under the constant lingering threat of physical violence. But things could have been worse. I could have been born hundreds of years ago. There are some workers in the modern world who love to explain how they're on such a cushy number. They're earning good money, they love their job, and they feel suitably fulfilled, and they get to sit on a really nice swivelly chair all day. Woo! I'm not sure if Danny's talking about me. <laughs> Uh, I do appreciate how absurdly lucky I am to be able to do this. I mean, what the f***?
And there are other workers who prefer to bang on about how their dreams and ambitions have been crushed up to a pulp by a grueling job that they hate with a passion. They despise their work, their complete wanker of a boss, the environment, or even their own alarm clock, which provides the unwelcome cue for another wretched day of torment and despair. They despise the work, their complete wanker of a boss, the environment, and even their own alarm clock. I was like, for a moment there, I was like, they hate the environment? What's that got to do with anything? And it means, he means like the environment at the office. How dare you? Uh, not like the actual environment out there that we're destroying. <laughs> ah! I was thinking about getting an electric car recently. I was like, Should I? it seems like a good thing to do. It's good for the environment. Should probably get one of those instead of some like massive gas guzzling beast. And then I was like, yeah, but it sounds like a real hassle. And I know, like, sometimes it's not a hassle, but also sometimes it is. And it's like, I just hate the idea of rolling into a charging station. And it's like, oh, it's not a fast charge. So I gotta be here for an hour. And both of the slots are taken. <laughs> it's like, ah! So I'm like, no, I'm not ready. Actually, let me rephrase that. I'm ready. The world's not ready. Profound. <laughs> No what the fuck are you talking about? And they even hate their own alarm clock, which provides the unwelcome cue for another wretched day of torment and despair. But the people in the latter category would have plenty more to moan about in the olden days, and they wouldn't even have the luxury of an alarm clock. They were likely to have been awoken by a knocker-upper whose job it was to wander around the streets in the early morning and bang on bedroom windows with a big pointy stick until the workers had awoken from their deep slumber. Exactly what kind of job you'd be getting knocked up to do might depend on the advice that you wouldn't have been given by the careers officer who didn't yet exist. But perhaps the ultimate job would have been groom of the stool by the time we got to- Oh my god, are we finally beginning? Oh, Danny, come on! This is like at least 15 minutes. I'm not even joking. Uh... Why are you crying? <laughs> By the time we got to the Tudor period, it had been decided that the King of England required round-the-clock assistance in going to the toilet, <laughs> and so the position of groom of the King's close stool had to be added to the innermost circle of the privy chamber. It's like, what the f***, man? I mean, I guess, like, there's stuff people could do for you, but as you sit down, you take a shit, and then you wipe your ass. I guess you could have someone wipe your ass for you, but I'd be like, I'd find that weird, for one, and look, I know we're all gonna end up, like, super f up and like people wiping our asses for us if we're lucky enough to live that long lucky enough i mean sh sometimes i want to live forever but sometimes i'm also like when i get to about 80 can someone just take me out back and uh tch -tch -tch, because i want to be able to wipe my own ass and then i want to die um yeah which i know and then it's also like simon you could also get some disease where you can't wipe your own ass and i'm like oh don't say that why what are we talking about in fact by the turn of the 16th century the groom was pretty much the top dog of the chamber how many people are you having assist you in chamber king the stool in question actually refers to the toilet itself rather than what would be getting dumped into it oh an early version of the portal the stool was a little box or cabinet which opened up to reveal a bowl made from pewter or earthenware <laughs> This guy's just in charge of this, like, shit box. It's like, what's that? It's a mahogany box, and uh, inside there is a porcelain bowl where the king shall shit into. And then, because, I mean, nowadays people are like, let's preserve it in resin. Why have I started getting recommended resin videos on YouTube all the time? I'll just be watching it and be like, I mean, I guess because I click on them, because I'm like, oh my god, what if you do put a burger in resin? And then I see it's got like 4 million views, and I'm like, what am I doing with my life? I should just put sh in resin. I should put Peter in resin. See how he does. Peter's my plant. If you're new, there's going to be a movement to put Peter in resin, isn't there? God damn it! Poor Peter. The groom was required to carry around the stool all day while following the king's every movement, particularly of the bowel variety. But a bum He would also be closely monitoring the king's diet and snack break so that he could plan ahead and schedule the day around predicted bowel motions <laughs> perfectly on why don't you just have, if it's always there just be like yo i'm the king i'm gonna take a shit now everyone can wait oh poop it's like if i was if, if I was like but sir we're right in the middle of sorting out the latest cabinet reshuffle it was like off i'm the king you wait it's like oh what's that there's that great line in a movie or a TV show or something, where someone says, um, 
like they're that they're waiting for a meeting with the president he's like 30 minutes late and the person's like he's running really late and the assistant just says the president's never late and that's it and it just is just to imply that you're less important <laughs> it's like the meeting begins when the president arrives whenever that may be <laughs> probably house of cards it sounds like a very house of cards line or perhaps something written by aaron sorkin perfectly on cue the green would whip out the magic brown cabinet whilst also making sure that he was on hand to bride water towels and a wash bowl <laughs> oh yeah it's the fast he's got to wipe his ass with a towel it's probably not even very nice <laughs> That smells like ass. There's intense debate over whether the groom would actually have been required to wipe the king's bottom after the chocolate rockets had descended into the murky puddle of tranquility. This was perhaps quite likely in some cases, as the act of self-wiping would have been seen as too improper for the divine royalty. But there's not much in the way of evidence to support this, and I'm not sure we'll see the evidence either way. Okay, so it's like, maybe they did, maybe they didn't, maybe no one cares. Also, it's so crazy how in the past, like, you know, that, that comment there about him being, like, divine royalty and whatever, it's like, literally literally in the past people used to believe that the king was like the voice of god so if he, if the king said something it was god being channeled through him i like that's nuts can you imagine looking, I, I, maybe we slab these laws today or something because you you could believe in in england with all our stupid royal family shit. be like um the queen says something and she's like i'm channeling god and she's getting really old now so she could be getting all, she's really old she's like 97 or something she could be getting all demented and stuff and being like god has told me this and anyone else you'll be like oh off but with the queen you'd be like this is gonna cause a constitutional crisis <laughs> the queen saying all sorts of crazy again she's like dissolve parliament everything's working fine queen we got going on in ukraine jesus christ your majesty but believe it or not the groom of the store was considered to be a pretty powerful and influential position you had the king's ear even during his most vulnerable moments, and petitioners would often lobby the groom to pass on messages during potty time. And you really do. <laughs> give it, so just like someone give me a ring while I'm taking a shit to tell me something. I'll be like, I'm gonna call you back. Unless sometimes I'm taking a shit, it's like, hey, we've got a delivery for you. So for it right now, I'm taking a shit. And you really didn't want to get on the wrong side of the groom, as you never knew what he might end up whispering to the king. A loyal groom would be rewarded with a sizable pay packet, decent lodgings, and first dibs on the king's old clothes and bedchamber furnishings, often spun from the finest silk and velvet. <laughs> Wait, so it's, can you imagine? You go to a job interview, and you you know you're interviewing with the CEO or whatever, but like, I don't know some like vice president position. I don't know how companies work. Something like, something like that. It's weird. Right, anyway, it's weird that you have a chief executive officer, but then you have a vice president. Is there a president? I guess. But isn't he on the board? He's not in that. I don't know. Look, companies are confusing. Um, but I'm just saying, you would go to interview there as a vice president, and they'd be like, so what are the perks? Well, uh, you get to use um, the company. You get to have a company car. You get a really nice pay packet, six figures. And uh, you get to have my old suits. <laughs> Like, what the f They fit you. They don't fit me. You imagine Henry VIII, you're a fat fuck. I'm the groom of the stool. I'm like hungry most of the time. I've been a peasant urchin my whole life. How am I going to fit in your giant jewel encrusted fat clothes, Henry? And also, I haven't been wiping your ass properly, so they're probably a bit stained. Hugh Denny's was groomed Henry VII and ended up becoming the king's fiscal policy advisor and the owner of four manors. Meanwhile, John Stewart became. <laughs> Like, what did you say? I wiped the king's ass. And now I'm, in, now, now I'm basically finance minister. <laughs> Maybe John, meanwhile, John Stewart became positively flushed with power after serving his mad king to George III's groom. He went on to become the prime minister. <laughs> That's Great Britain, oh my god. This is a good position. You've got to wipe the king's ass for a few years and then you basically become god whenever a queen took to the throne as in the british throne rather than the portable commode ah, ah, a woman would be given the new title of first lady of the bedchamber that sounds a bit posher but it was pretty much a different title for the same job the role was finally abolished in 1901 oh my god really by king edward the seventh who had clearly come to the conclusion that he could have just about managed his own toilet training but it's a shame in a way that this potential route to power was blocked by the bloody 20th century. How refreshing it might have been to see the likes of Margaret Thatcher and Boris Johnson climb their way up the ladder from lowly position of groom of the stool. They always say it can be character building to start at the bottom. Ah, now just before we continue with today's video, I do want to say that it is brought to you by HelloFresh. What is HelloFresh? Well, I'll tell you what, they make home cooking easy, fun, 
and affordable, which is why it's America's number one meal kit. So there you go. Get in, you know, get in with the number one guys. That's how you want to do it. HelloFresh helps you reach your goals. You can maintain your goals and take control of your food choices with HelloFresh. Getting a homemade meal on the table every day is an accomplishment worth celebrating. Oh my God. It's definitely something I do not achieve. It's like, yeah, no, we could order in tonight, couldn't we? Every day. Look, even it. Look, honestly, you, you don't have to do it every day. It's okay. I mean, you can aim to, but don't feel bad about yourself if you're not managing that. The HelloFresh can really help you get there. The recipes are also delicious if you find yourself making the same food over and over again. I certainly find myself doing that as well. HelloFresh Fresh can break you out of that recipe rut and teach you how to cook new things, which is fantastic. It also saves time and stress. For me, I don't find cooking particularly stressful, Like, and that's nice with HelloFresh because all the ingredients come there, because the part I find stressful is the gathering of the food, like going to the supermarket, getting the meat, getting the stuff and then you're like oh the supermarket doesn't have any cream or whatever so you have to go to the little store on the corner and buy cream separately and then you spend like half an hour just shopping before you've actually even started cooking that stuff frustrates me i don't like it at all which is why hellofresh is so fantastic plus sustainable their pre-portioned ingredients mean there's less prep and less wasted food uh, uh they always ask they say endorsement and cooking footage required this isn't actually me cooking this because i don't live where hellofresh exists but i have my american friends get the hellofresh delivery and he makes it and he has assured me that it is delicious and this only serves to make me jealous of the fact that i can't have hellofresh but if you can don't be like me get yourself some hellofresh so go to hellofresh.com and use code brain 16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts that sounds fun and now back to today's video a match made in hell. Oh, this one doesn't actually sound too bad. During the Victorian era, thousands of women and young girls were given an opportunity to make matches in one of 25 new factories scattered around the UK. Oh, what an opportunity. You tell my daughter is like, listen, daughter, I've got some fantastic news. There's a great opportunity in matchmaking. Not dating. Don't be thinking that. Literally the making of matches. Wait, this is the making of matches, right? We're not actually talking about like some Victorian era matchmaking because that could also be a thing. Also, what the f matchmaking is such a strange word. All you had to do was take a thin stick and dip both ends in white phosphorus. Both ends? Matches just have it on one end. What are you talking about? The sticks would later be oven dried and cut into two separate matches. Oh, okay. Well, there we go. I should just read these, shouldn't I? Sounds simple enough, but sadly, the working conditions of the match girls are even worse than those as an Amazon warehouse. Well, that is some competition. About, allegedly, about half the workforce were children had to put up with a working day of 16 hours a day in a cramped, dark factory with barely any breaks in return for a meager pay packet. Oh, come on, Danny, at least they're getting paid. When was this? Maybe slavery was. No, slavery wasn't still a thing. When was this? When was this? When was this? Oh, Victorian era. I don't think there was slavery then, was there? I mean, of course, there's modern day slavery, but like old school slavery, you know, famous slavery. <laughs> I don't want to say the bad one because obviously modern day slavery is also horrible. Look, I don't want to. <laughs> what are you digging? Your what sort of hole are you digging, Simon? It's slavery. It's all bad. Jesus. It's like, oh no, 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 not that slavery. The good slavery. <laughs> Amazon slave. Mm, careful, don't get sued. What are you doing today? You're actually trying to get sued and cancelled in the same episode. What is wrong with you? In a stunning turn of events, a superhero is being sued. But the biggest danger is the white phosphorus. Although the element is crucial to all living creatures and can be found in your bones and teeth, it can turn incredibly toxic if you absorb too much of it. And these match girls weren't just exposed to stuff throughout a very long for, uh, long shift. They were practically binging on it every day as they were forced to eat their infected lunches at their infected workstations with their infected fingers. Oh, God. <laughs> Phosphorus poisoning could lead to lung inflammation, strangely fluorescent vomiting, and the ability to glow in the dark, or at least your clothes would be giving off an eerie green glow by the time you got home. Yeah, but in the past, no one understood this shit. To be like, hey, look, I got a job at a fa uh, like uh, the, the the phosphorus factory, and also, as a perk, not only do I get my boss's old suits, but they glow in the fucking dark. You're fucking kidding, right? That's white phosphorus. Yeah, I know what it is. But the most serious ailment was phosphorus necrosis of the jaw, most commonly known as fossy jaw, which sounds like a lot of fun for a horrible f disease, doesn't it? It's like, hey, what's that? Fossy jaw. What does that mean? My jaw has fallen off. It's been poisoned to death, and now I just have the upper part of my face. 
far now. This terrible disease essentially caused the victim's jaw to start rotting away, causing severe swollen disfigurement and giving off a rancid discharge as gums began to abscess. Oh my god, that is horrible. <laughs> It could also potentially spread to the brain and lead to a horribly painful death unless the whole jaw was removed. Oh my god, why is that horrible TV show? There's a horrible TV show where there's a guy and you don't see him for a long time, but then you find out that you can't you haven't seen him because his whole jaw, just from here downwards, was burned off by like some acid and some torture thing because he talked. And it's like holy shit. What is that horrible TV show? That I don't remember. One of the biggest matchmaking companies was Plenty of Fish. Not really. It was Bryant and May. They weren't entirely sympathetic to the plight of the match girls. <laughs> Holy s***. It's like, why aren't you at work? My jaw fell off. Come get in a bloody work. They are alleged to have simply sacked anyone who began showing symptoms of fossy jaw or ordered them to get all of their teeth pulled out so they wouldn't smell quite so putrid. Matilda, you smell disgusting. It's your jaw. Can you get it removed? You f***ing beast! However, I'm pleased to say that the Match Girls fought back. Following the unfair dismissal of one of their number at a factory in Bow, London, or Bow, London, I don't know. It's one of those words that has two potential pronunciations, and I don't know which one is correct. Or is it Bow Street or Bow Street on the Monopoly board? Americans are like, what the fuck are you talking about? There's no Bow Street on the Monopoly board. It's like, yeah, we have our own version. Which, uh, I thought my whole life that was the original version. Nope, the American one is the original version fascinating stuff simon thank you for such an interesting tangent that no one cares about i don't remember asking you a goddamn thing uh, the factory in bow in london in 1888 around 1400 match girls down tools and refused to carry on working until their colleagues were reinstated oh my god it's like they've got terrible fossy drawer and they're fighting to get them back into the place that gave them fossy drawer i mean i feel i don't know how i feel about like i don't no one should have to work. What are you talking about, Simon? No one should have to work in a poisonous factory. But I'm just saying, like, I do believe that people should have to work for money. I don't think the government should just give out money. Although I do also, there are also very good points for a universal basic income. I'm not against that idea. So maybe I am for this. But I'm not, like, generally someone who's like, yeah, government should give out money for no reason whatsoever. Um, but also, this shouldn't happen. There should be like workplace safety and people shouldn't be so poor that their jaw is falling off and they have to go back to somewhere where they got the jaw falling off disease called fossy jaw <laughs> holy sh Even when Brian and May quickly reversed their decision, the match girls made it clear they hadn't quite finished yet. They only returned to work when the company agreed to stop deducting their rages with wages with ridiculously unfair fines, opened the door for grievances to be taken directly to management, and set up a separate dining area which wasn't completely contaminated with white phosphorus. So they know it's poisonous. They're like, I don't like eating in the phosphorus poison room. The use of white phosphorus in matchmaking was later banned by the House of Commons in 1910, although the health problems would continue to be reported for several years to follow. Of course, like asbestos, people are still dying of like mesothelioma today, even though asbestos has been banned for a long time. Although I made a video about like Canada and asbestos, and it's like, oh my god, Canada. When I think of like countries that are good, I think of like the Nordic countries, I think of Canada. For some reason, I think of Switzerland, even though that's not true. <laughs> I just think of Switzerland's like neutral. They're not good. They're not bad. Although they did hide a lot of that nasty gold, did they, Switzerland? I mean, what the f***? Uh, but also Canada was like, they're still like mining asbestos today. And like shipping that sh to the third world, allegedly. I say allegedly just in case they aren't. But I remember that being true. Possibly. Still, it just shows what can be achieved when the match girls go on strike. There's definitely a joke that I'm missing there, isn't there, Danny? Shit. Oh, you strike a match. Ah, funny. I may be an idiot. <laughs> but I'm not stupid. Whipped scheme. The worst kind of school teacher was the idiot who punished everyone for the actions of a few. I can remember a time when my old science teacher, Mr. Taylor, handed out a detention to every boy in the class just because a few of the other boys had been playing the goat. What the f is playing the goat? <laughs> All the glass got away scot free. It was just the boys who had to share the punishment for the misbehavior of a few pupils in the class who also happened to be born with a penis. Yeah, I remember that. I'd never come across this. And then we had a new teacher come to the school who was like, Yeah, I'm doing this thing called global punishment. And I was like, And everyone was like, What the f is this? And it's like, If one of you do something bad, all of you get punished. 
And we were like, that's new and doesn't sound fair. It's like, holy sh**. Although that guy later got punished because it turns out he was a pedophile. <laughs> this Don't laugh at that. That's really intense. <laughs> This might have been more acceptable in the 1890s, but this was the 1990s. I'm not sure how we were meant to learn a valuable lesson from that. And Mr. Taylor, if you're watching this, you had a head shaped like a potato. <laughs> Danny. Danny. Danny, Danny. I know we've mentioned it, like, not, uh, not calling out people by name before. There was one episode where Danny was just, like, fully slagging off someone's full name. He used to be his boss at Tesco. And I was like, Danny, I can't put that out into the world. I know you don't like him, and you probably have this grievance, but it's a bit unfair to just start slagging someone off and could be clearly identifiable on a huge platform. On my platform. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way. Eh, maybe that was okay. I don't know. Let's carry on. Although we're probably all familiar with the term whipping boy. I don't know why I just love pronouncing like whipping, like stuff like that with that kind of like wha. I don't know why. It's weird. Like I'm I'm Simon Whistler. Ha <laughs> ha 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 ha! Another teacher at school. Oh, we, we, we everyone would call us by our surnames because that was school, and so it'd be Whistler. And one teacher always, wi uh, let me try and do it. He'd call me Whistler, like Whistler. It was really weird. I can't even do it. Whistler, like that. And I was like, okay. I guess it was kind of funny. <laughs> Great story, Simon. Thank you. Brilliant. You're learning loads about my school days today. <laughs> oh my God. My stomach is rumbling like a beast. Check this out. Come on. Never mind, it's not working anymore. What the hell is even that? Describing a term for a whipping boy describes a term for a scapegoat who takes all of the flack for the faults of others. Perhaps not everyone is aware that the term is derived from alleged childhood profession that was even more brutal than a paper rounds in Yorkshire during a hail. This is so loud, I can't believe it. Come on! Never mind. What is going on? Um, Excuse me, what are you doing? I say alleged because historians can't actually agree as to whether whipping boys ever genuinely existed. It relates to a prickly problem from the 16th and 17th centuries. What exactly was the teacher meant to do? with a misbehaving prince. Back then, the monarchy came packaged with divine status. We mentioned this already today, which meant that the king, which meant that only the king had the right to punish his mischievous son. Your typical commoner teacher would never have dared raise their hand to a prankish prince who had been chosen by God because the prince was clearly above the teacher's pay grade. But the problem, uh, but the problem is that the, I'm making all, uh, oh God. I should have had some breakfast. It's just that unpleasant, I didn't have breakfast burp. Hmm. Hmm. I am disgusted. But the problem is that the king was often busy fighting wars, or holding PowerPoint presentations, or eating himself to death. So, what was the teacher meant to do when an errant prince started cap 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 catapulting conkers from the back of the class? Well, it was believed for many centuries that the prince's best friend would have been given the job of whipping boy. Every time the prince misbehaved, his best friend would be dragged from his desk and given the punishment, say, a damn good thrashing, which was considered out of bounds for the noble prince. <laughs> I'd just make sure it's like, yeah, who's your best friend? Definitely Tim. Definitely Tim. Don't hate Tim at all. Also, uh, Tim, I'm going to have Dad chop your head off. Because <laughs> as fun as it is to get you see, see you get beaten up by the teacher, I'm the f***ing prince. And your head is coming off, mate. That's a little gay. Hold on. The idea was that the prince would be ragged with guilt and remorse after watching his mate take the rap for his own mischievous wrongdoings. Yeah. Right. Imagine having that set up at your own school. Some spoiled brat already knows he's of a higher status than the teacher. And now he suddenly realizes that some poor sucker could take a beating every time he steps out of line. <laughs> the prince is just gonna... The prince is just gonna riot all day long. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Ah, 
And this is why you should choose your friends carefully. It's not like you could even get away with exacting your revenge on the prince during break time without getting accused of treason. However, much like the groom to the stool, the role of whipping boy was supposedly seen as a highly desirable position with some pretty big perks in the long term. William Murray was widely reported to, the whipping bo to be the whipping boy for a young Charles I during the early 17th century. He went on to become one of the king's most trusted advisers and was given the keys to Ham House right next door to Richmond Palace. And he was awarded the title of the first Earl of Dysart. <laughs> Brilliant. All he had to do was get beaten the shit out of while Charles I was running around like a right dickhead. I love that we can say all this shit past kings. It's so great to be in the future. Whereas in the past, you make a video like this or like make a play like this, and people will be like, off with his head, he insulted Charles I. And it's like Charles I was a bell end. However, I don't know much about Charles I. To be honest, maybe he was awesome. However, I've probably made a video about him. <laughs> People are like, how do you not know anything about Charles I? You run a channel called Biographics and you literally made like a 25 minute video about the dude. And as I always say, I don't remember anything. That's it, mister! You just lost your brain privileges! However, although some historians remain convinced that the whippings were very much genuine, others have pointed to the lack of contemporary evidence. The concept was widely popularized in later plays and novels, most likely The Prince and the Pauper by Mark Twain, but it's also been suggested that the concept was a reaction to later events. For example, in the case of King Charles I, the whipping boy theory was wheeled out as criticism of William Murray, who was perceived to be a yes man to a deeply unpopular monarch. Well, turns out he was a bell end. Yes. Uh, who was himself deemed to be a man who never had to face consequences of a bad decision. We'll never know for sure, and although very probably it wasn't a very common practice, it may well have been used as a desperate last resort from the teacher's handbook. Potato Head Taylor may have got his warped ideas from somewhere. rat a tat tat The job of rat catcher hasn't entirely been exterminated. Oh my god, yeah, no jokes. I'm using a mouse catcher. Have I talked about this before? I'm doing a mouse genocide in my holiday house. Like, I went there, we went there for a week. This was two months ago, like over Christmas to hang out and there's there's mice in the attic it's like a house in the country there's mice in the attic it's part of life and uh but we, we were there for like a week just hanging out and uh then the mice came downstairs and they went in, my my wife and i sleep separately because we don't like no just kidding because we have a newborn baby and i have the uh, in the holiday house like they can't sleep in the same room the two kids or they drive each other in say why am i explaining this i don't need to explain my personal life to you <laughs> Um, anyway, so this mouse comes downstairs and it goes into the bedroom with my wife and the baby. And uh, my wife's like, it's not really working out, is it? And I'm like, let's see what Google says. And I Google it. Google says, don't do that. <laughs> so we leave. And I just set up like tons of mouse traps in the, in the attic. And my father-in-law's like, I don't know if mouse traps are going to work. I once put down mouse traps in the, in the cellar of our house to get the, uh, to get the mice. Didn't get any of them. And uh, I was like, oh man, so what am I going to do? Poison these mice? And then they're going to crawl into a wall and die and start to smell the whole place out. And then you just got to wait for them to like skeletize. Is that a word? Like rot, so their flesh what rots away and they're just a non-smelling skeleton. Lovely. Um, so I put, there were like nine traps in, in around the house. I came back like a few days later to clear out the, the mice so they don't start to smell. F***ing seven out of eight had just mashed up mice in them. And I'm like, oh my God. And now I put like 10 more out, came back, five, and now there are 10 there. And every time I go, there are no more mice. They are all dead. Their little broken necks. Lovely. <laughs> My mum once phoned the council when a massive rat was found squatting in a kitchen and they sent out a guy from the pest control department. Wait, someone will do this for you? What? Okay. I found out here in Czech Republic, um, the people who deal, if you've got a wasp's nest, like in your house, you know who deals with that? You don't call pest control, the fire department here do it and they do it for free in the uk you got to pay a man to come out and just deal with this like bees nest or wasp nest that's growing in your house whereas here you just call the fire department and they send someone out <laughs> and he just just oh, it's like okay he was like that's who you call the only problem was that he appeared to be absolutely terrified of rats even though i was only about 10 years old at the time he was getting me to do all the dirty work while he went and cowered on the stairs is this real and he later swore blind that the rat had definitely evacuated the property when i could clearly still see a rat tail lurking conspicuously behind the fridge be like yo mate it's there i can see its tail moving i can hear it making all those weird rat sounds what the f***? 
I suspect that this guy wasn't called upon to catch rats very often. So what the f*** is he catching? But I would hope that the Victorian pest control was a slightly made a slightly sterner stuff back then, uh, as rat catching was a full-time profession. 19th century London was awash with filth, disease, and plague. <laughs> so yeah, the past was the worst. So it's no surprise that millions of disease-infected rats were setting up home and making themselves comfy in the households and factories and sewers and darkest corners of this giant pig trough. So naturally, this was a perfect opportunity for an entrepreneurial soul with no capital but a strong stomach to set up as a professional rat catcher. Many of them started very young. Kids in the poorer areas had been playing with rats under the floorboard since they first started to crawl, and rat catching seemed like a natural progression. Who the f I mean, I know back in the day we didn't understand diseases and stuff, so we were like, yeah, yeah, playing with rats, it seems fine. You look at a f***ing rat and then it's like, oh, the children getting bitten, they're getting like f***ing plague. And we're just like, no, it's cool. It's cool. We just let them play with the rats. I mean, they got to do something all day and it sets them up for a great profession as a rat catcher, doesn't it? No worries. The pay wasn't too shabby either. The households and businesses and fancy manners would usually pay you by live rats. Oh, why do you want it alive? We're all gonna die. So you'd present the bulging bag of live rats as evidence, and if they refused to cough up, you'd then threaten, threaten to release them all again. Well, that's fairly clever. Payment was usually pretty prompt, prompt, and even a child working alone could rustle up a few shillings in a day. I have no idea what that means. My grandparents used shillings, like shillings, pounds, and pence, or like that. Is that what the f*** the shilling? <laughs> If you were just getting started in the profession and didn't have the funds to splash out on accessories, you'd usually just catch the rats by hands, ideally a hand which had been lathered in sweet-smelling oils to lure out the vermin. Oh my god, <laughs> this is so weird. After you've taken a few more rungs up the rat-catching ladder, you might be able to afford upgrades such as ferrets and dogs. The ferrets would flush out the rats from their hiding place, allowing the dogs, usually a terrier, to grab hold of the rodents. And there was always an opportunity for a few side hustles in the rat game, as the rats were most frequently caught alive, they could be sold on to dodgy London taverns who staged rat pit contests in which dozens of live rats were thrown into a pit with a dog. Oh my god. What are you up to, the past? And the punters placed bets on how long it would take the dog to clean up. Jesus Christ. Jack Black was probably the most famous celebrity rat catcher of all time. Wow, that's a... I mean, Jack Black had a weird career change. He claimed to be Queen Victoria's official... Oh, different Jack Black, I see. He claimed to be Queen Victoria's official rat catcher, although a royal... Royal warrant... There we go. Was never issued. But he was a bit of a showman who dressed in outlandish homemade uniform, which included metal rat shaped medallions that had apparently made by melting down his wife's saucepan collection when she wasn't looking. <laughs> Jack Black, what are you up to, mate? Jack often paraded the streets of London with his cart full of live rats and would occasionally put on a show, which he was designed to shift a few bottles of his homemade poison. <laughs> Professional rat catchers rarely resorted to using crude poison themselves. Not only does it leave a hideous stench in the house as the poison rats begin to decompose in the walls and plaster, yes, exactly, and I know this, I, I'm familiar with this. My parents had a rat die in like the, the under the floor in their house and it was a tiled floor so somehow the rat got down there died i don't think they were poisoning it or mouse or whatever and the house stank for like months as that thing just decomposed and other than digging up the floor there was just and like searching for where the dead rat was there was nothing that could be done and it just smelled bad the whole time. But it can also harm unintended targets such as wild well, birds, pets, and your children. But people like Jack were happy to hawk their poison on the side, and this would often include a fun live demonstration in the streets of just how quickly it takes a rat to die from the bargain concoction. Just when things are finally looking up, <laughs> we're all gonna die. <laughs> Kind of like a really crap bargain bucket version of Punch and Judy. We have to applaud the bravery of people like Jack Black, who were taking considerable risks when they clocked in in the morning. Just one bite from an infected rat could potentially have proved fatal, and Jack himself claimed that he had several close brushes with death during his rat chasing adventures. And also, wasn't it like you're hanging around with rats? Don't they have the fleas that cause plague? So I know they didn't know to look out for those, but still. 
It's not a fun time. There was almost certainly a long list of fatalities from young aspiring rat catchers who tragically bit off more than they could chew. The full-time profession had gradually slipped off the radar by the close of the 19th century, following the development of sanitary networks, which helped to push the rats deeper into the shadows. Oh, by the way, I've got another channel called Into the Shadows. If you'd like to check that out, subscribe, why not? But here's a thought. Was the whole thing a big, bloody scam? The business model required the rat catcher to present a big bag of live rats to the clients, which would then be taken away by the catcher after payment was given. I'll be like, no, you've got to kill those rats now, because otherwise you're going to come back tomorrow and be like, look at all these rats I cow caught. Give me some shillings. So surely all you really needed for a prosperous working week is a single big bag of live rats, which could be whipped out on cue every time. They had it so easy in the olden days. Those lazy bums, they'd never make it in an O2 call center. This has been an episode of Brain Blaze. Thank you so much. Oh. Nothing. Nothing. Ah, uh, a brain blaze and my tummy. Oh, come on! Um, episode of Brain Blaze. Thanks for watching the stuff. This is going to cause a constitutional crisis. <laughs> the Queen saying all sorts of crazy again. She's like, dissolve Parliament! Everything's working fine, Queen. We've got going on in Ukraine. Jesus. Christ. Your Majesty.